and we'll get started. Um, so I have the floor and I get to hog the first few minutes of, of the presentation. Again, this is Snowdy Dodson with the California Native Plant so Society, uh, Los Angeles, Santa Monica Mountains chapter. Um, I would like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the first peoples of Los Angeles, um, who continue to act as stewards of sacred places such as by Bay Bayona wetland, wetlands. And um, it's hard to acknowledge every tribe and every group because just like California is one of the most diverse places on earth botanically, it's also uh, ethnically and anthropologically uh, diverse. Many, many tribes, many, many groups, many, many language groups. So uh, you need as for yourself to look at where do you live? What lands are currently, I don't know, under the control of different tribes. My in my in the San Fernando Valley, it's the Tetevian. Uh, Bayana Woodlands is probably the Tongva. And there are many other groups depending upon uh, geographically where you are. And these folks are still here. They're still very active and involved in uh, land stewardship. So Let's keep that in mind as we discuss things like Bayona and other places that are open spaces that we all value. So announcements. Uh, our next meeting via Zoom will be on Tuesday, March 14th at 7 p.m. And the, it's gonna be on Tatavian ethnobotany and climate resiliency. And, um, this will be moderated by uh, Miguel Luna, who's the, the Director of Tribal Historic and Cultural Preservation for the Tataviums. Um, our next hike will be on Saturday, March 11th at 9.30 a.m. Uh, it will be at the Elephant Hill Restoration Project. And we'll post this information on our webpage and it will go out in our newsletter at the end of uh, February. Uh, this coming Saturday, uh, February 18th uh, from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m., uh, tar the Tarzana Native Plant Fair will be going on. This is the second event uh, that we've had there. Uh, it's at the Tarzana uh, Cultural Center and that's at 19130 Ventura Boulevard. And there'll be booths and native plants for sale, books for sale, uh, talks, and all kinds of wonderful things going on. Now, I just heard that it's probably not going to rain. So I think it will, it will, this will work out for us this time. The the last time this was going to happen of a month or so ago was that weekend, it rained like crazy. So it had to be canceled. And does anybody else have any announcements that they would care to make? Okay. This evening, Walter Lamb, who's the president of the Bayona Lands Trust, is going to update us on native plant stewardship at the Bayona wetlands. So he will share his uh, screen and make his presentation. Thank you, Walter, for agreeing to, to join us this evening. Thank, thank you, Snowdy, and thanks for everyone else in the chapter for having me. Um, <clears throat> I am with the Bayona Wetlands Land Trust, which is a nonprofit organization that was founded in 1994 and uh, got our 501c3 status in 1996. One of the founders tells me that they were meeting in 1993, but I go by when the Articles of Incorporation were made, which was 1994. I did not move to Los Angeles until 2001. I moved out here with my wife, um, Courtney. And uh, about 10 years later, we had a daughter, Emily, who's now 11 and a half. 
and who loves to go down to the Bayana Wetlands. We have seven, a seven member board of directors, one of whom is on the phone and I, I am gonna introduce her and, uh, and unmute her uh, briefly. I uh, know so we talked about getting through the presentation, but I wanna give her a chance to, to make a few remarks. Um, our focus is on education, stewardship, outreach, and litigation. We do litigate as a last resort. Some people, when they hear us say last resort, they maybe roll their eyes because we have been involved in quite a bit of litigation. But when I say last resort, it means that we never file a lawsuit until we really go above and beyond trying to work collaboratively with whoever it is that we think may be running afoul, whether intentionally or not, of uh, laws that are designed to protect the environment. So um, I will get into that maybe a little bit as we go on towards the end. Um, obviously, we don't have that much time. Uh, let me get to my next slide here. Happy Valentine's Day to everybody. And again, I, I mentioned my wife earlier, call out to her because I, I said, you know, I have a presentation to make on Valentine's Day. Is that okay? And she said, of course. Um, this is a picture of a black neck stilt. Very cool bird. Um, you look at a bird like that, you think you maybe have to go to a really exotic place to see a bird that cool, but they're actually quite common in the Biona Creek and the Biona Wetlands. Um, we'll be talking a little bit more about some of the birds. This, by the way, is Southeast Area B. Now, I know a lot of people know that there's a, um, a string of RVs along Jefferson Road or Jefferson Boulevard. That's a, a complex issue. Um, I think, unfortunately, it tends to get, uh, it's important, but I think it tends to sort of suck up all the oxygen of talking about the Biona wetlands. And we've had people come to, you know, field trips or nature walks and say, I almost didn't come because I heard it was dangerous. We really try to put the word out that the, the extent of the RVs, while you know, certainly not great for the environment, and, and I would, you know, think probably certainly not great for, for uh, those people, um, is, you know, one of many issues. But anyways, this black neck stilt is right there. That's my favorite place right now to go with my binoculars and camera, is right in behind those RVs where there's a, now a seasonal market. We'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, our primary objective for 2023, and my key point, I hope that you will uh, take away from this presentation, is we're trying to facilitate the adoption of management policies that will benefit native plants and native wildlife, both now and in the future. And really trying to zero in on this, what seems should be a, a non-controversial thing. And I'll explain a little bit more about this. 2023 is also the 20 year anniversary of the acquisition of this land by the public for $140 million. That actually happened, the uh, approval was made, I believe in October, 2003 by the Wildlife Conservation Board. It did not become a um, ecologic reserve until it was designated as such in 2005. I think that was August of 2005. Now, a key component of this, and when you asked about the land acknowledgement, I, I was happy for you to make a general land acknowledgement because I wanted to you know, touch on it in the same way, but maybe a little bit more specific tonight to tonight's presentation. Um, it's important for us to make sure that tribal knowledge of the many indigenous people, and so you, you, you mentioned that you said currently, right? And that's something that, to be honest, I've learned relatively recently. I'm a little embarrassed about, about that, but I, like many people, used to think of indigenous culture as something that was in the past, you know, that you'd study historically. And um, I've learned that, um, as you said, many people, there are many people right now, and by, the Bino Wellness has really benefited from those people. So a lot of, you know, names, and I'd, I'd like to keep reaching out, meeting more people, but I know that John Tommy Rosas, for, for a very long time, um, spent a great deal of time and effort, you know, trying to figure out what was going on at the Bino Wetlands and ensuring that, you know, it was in the best interest of the ecosystem from his perspective uh, as an indigenous person. We're very lucky, our organization, um, I'll, well, let me just start here on the left, is an old um, article in the LA Times. And part of what I think is relevant about this is that the history of the Bino Wetlands, of course, goes back a long, long time, you know, back you know, thousands of years. But sort of the modern discussion of you know, restoration also goes back to at least the 80s. And I think that this photo was, was from some time in the 80s. Does Manuel and Vera Rocha gather Indian herbs and wetlands beside Bino Creek? Uh, Vera Rocha particularly was um, really a leader in defending the Bino wetlands from encroachment. And some folks might remember DreamWorks wanted to construct a, a pretty huge facility there. And Vera Rocha was one of the leaders against that 
um, a whole coalition sort of joined forces and we were able to stop that. We weren't able to stop all the development in that area, but we did actually get about twice as much land as what people thought we were going to get. When I first moved here in 2001, I remember a very nice gentleman was down at uh, what they call Titmouse Park, which sort of is along Culver Boulevard with a view into the wetlands and was telling us about the area and said, well, nothing north of the creek is going to get saved. Nothing east of Lincoln is going to get saved. There's a little pocket of, you know, the, the northwest, the northeast corner um, of this area that's not going to get saved, but we're going to save this part. And I thought, oh my goodness, that just doesn't seem like enough. We had seen all this open space and to, to learn that it was all under threat was really disconcerting. And so we found the Bino Wetlands Land Trust at the time was being run by a gentleman by the name of Tom Francis. And he was a very interesting person. And he said, we're going to save every single acre. And I knew that wasn't true, but I still wanted to join the organization that was going to try to save as many acres as possible. And we were successful saving about twice as much that was um, that was uh, thought would be saved. But um, so about two years ago, I was on a public meeting, public agency meeting where a lot of people were speaking and Gabrielle Crow started to, to talk and I was blown away. She was extremely knowledgeable, really well-spoken and was talking about outdoor nature education, which is near and dear to my heart and our organization's heart. And so I got in touch with her didn't realize at the time that she was the granddaughter of Vera Rocha and made a connection and asked her, would she join our board? And also would she help us with outdoor nature education, specifically with an eye towards, you know, understanding um, indigenous culture, you know, ancestral use of the land, current use of the land, you know, what's, what's happening today. And um, she did, and we're uh, much better off as an organization for it. And I'm going to try now to, um, Unmute, Gabriel. Can you unmute yourself? Or I'm I, I lost my ability to see the participants. Uh, Snowy, I don't know if you can do that. Okay, we got participants. Okay, let's move them. I think you can un unmute yourself. I just asked um, Gabrielle. Yeah, I'm. I can yeah, unmute myself. Can, okay, she can do that herself. <laughs> okay, great. Can you hear me? <laughs> we can hear you. Okay, yes. so Miha and good evening. Um, my name is Gabrielle Crow. So like Walter was saying, um, my maiden name is actually Rocha. Vera and Manuel were actually my grandparents. And so I've actually worked the last uh, 17 and a half years as an outdoor nature educator, um, taking kids whale watching, taking them and teaching about uh, the island ecology at Catalina Island. And so I got interested in working with the land trust because a lot of the work that I was already doing, we were trying to integrate that into um, some nonprofits. And so I've been working on some, writing some indigenous curriculum and we've actually presented it to several students in this last year. So I'm excited to continue going forward. And I think that there's a lot of great things to be done and there's a lot of cultural history at the Bayona wetlands, but and I can understand at the beginning of the conversation how, you know, doing a land acknowledgement, there are so many different Gabrielino groups. I'm actually um, vice chair for and the secretary for environmental sciences for the Gabrielino Shoshone Tribal Council of Southern California. But that's just one of many groups. So I can understand the difficulty sometimes in saying either Gabrielino, Tongva, other different groups. So um, but I appreciate that the land acknowledgement at the beginning of it. So I'm available. I mean, if anyone has any questions too, I'll let Walter continue his presentation, but um, I'm here. And so I appreciate the work that everybody's doing. So thank you. Thanks, Gabrielle. I, um, I feel terrible because I'm always behind in sort of getting to things just before they're due. And I, I literally called Gabrielle about an hour ago and said, oh, I think I forgot to invite you to this meeting. And so really appreciate your joining. And Gabrielle's a mom and she, it's a, she her, her time is limited, but that we we get as we take as much as we can get, and I would uh, encourage anyone on the phone to make a connection with Gabrielle because she's very 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 impressive. And Gabrielle, if you at any time want to jump in tonight, just you know raise your hand or something. And I'll try to see her. Maybe Snowy can see because um, you you have a, a a lot to say. And um, but yeah, we'll we'll go from there. Let's see uh, if I'm still on my track here. To just click next slide here. Okay. So the structure of the presentation, first we'll focus on the native plants because I think that's what all of you care about and um, that's what is exciting. And so we'll start with some pictures, talk about some of the native plants of Biona, 
Then we'll talk about some of the non-native, and I've got a little asterisk there, non-native plants of Biona. And below I say varying degrees of invasiveness, because to me, you, you know, it's, it's a spectrum of plants that in my opinion are, I use the word gnarly, you know, and um, sort of going as a gradation, you know, to, to ones that actually are slightly beneficial, even though they're non-native. And there are some native plants that aren't, let me, let me put it this way, some native plants that can be a threat to other native plants, right? That can be sort of invasive in that way. Um, and my opinion is just that everybody has a slightly different perspective of what, what do they think should be kept, what do they think there should be less of, what do they think is not really that harmful. Somebody corrected me on the walk on Saturday, because in my experience, you know, I see the whorehound down in that area, and it's taking up space that's sort of left over by other invasives and so uh, other non-natives. And so to my perspective, and I think I said, you know, it doesn't seem to spread as quickly as some of these others. And other people said, well, no, that's not the case when there's a lot of bare ground. So again, everyone has a slightly different perspective. And that's why it's good to share those perspectives and, you know, keep learning. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the restoration stewardship plans, right? So what's the plan for addressing, everybody seems to agree that it's a problem to, to you know, again, to one degree or another. So what are we doing about it? And the, the answer is a little bit, um, to me, you know, kind of alarming and surprising, but we'll, we'll go through that. We'll talk about the large scale project, which is stalled. And when I say stalled, I mean, it's just not going forward at the moment. Then there's an initial sequences project. You might hear it referred to as the sequences one and two project. I have a question mark there because we just have so many questions. And even though it was promised profusely up front that there was gonna be all kinds of public engagement and transparency, that, that just really hasn't been the case. There's so many basic questions they're still trying to get the answer to. And then interim stewardship, which would require CFW approval. There is some interim stewardship at the reserve, but it, it's very limited to just a few areas of the reserve and really just a, a few groups that are working on it. And then we'll end with Q&A. Again, down at the bottom, I just had a little asterisk, varying, varying degrees of invasiveness. Um, so just launching in, we have a lot of really cool plants at the Bayana Wetlands. Now this is pickleweed and it's arguably, you could make the case, we have a lot of very important plants. You never would want just a monoculture really of one thing, no matter how valuable it is. But I think you can make the case that this is one of our mo more important, if not the most important um, plant species because, and this by the way is an area A, same place that we were on Saturday, you know, when we kind of walked down the cars, we were looking at the pickleweed, um, except this was a different time of year. So you can see it's the pickleweed is much more lush and green, still would not have been enough for building some sparrow to nest, but interesting because it's growing there, right? So that tells us something about the, the area. Um, Belding Cement Sparrow is a state endangered species. It is a subspecies of the more ubiquitous uh, Savannah Sparrow, which you can find different subspecies all across the country. I'm originally from Boston. In that area, there's an Ipswich Sparrow looks quite different than this sparrow. This sparrow is dependent on pickleweed. You don't have Belding Savannah Sparrow where you don't have pickleweed. It's a salt tolerant bird. If you think about a lot of other salt tolerant birds like your gulls and your Jaegers, things that are out at sea, they typically have specialized nostrils that sort of filter out the salt. These birds obviously don't have that. It's a songbird. But what they do have is um, very uh, developed kidneys. That, so they've sort of evolved these very developed kidneys that can process uh, that more uh, salty environment. So pickleweed is necessary for that bird. That's one of at least three vegetation species dependencies that we have at the Bayana wetlands. And let's just first look at the habitat. So this is my first reference to the EIR. Now, this is actually the draft EIR, but unlike like a college paper, you write a draft and then you revise the draft and you submit a final paper, right, to your professor. In this case, the draft EIR just becomes the final layer. So if you always say draft EIR, don't assume that there's some other final EIR there's about 30 pages in the final EIR that talks about changes that were made. It's a really small number of changes between the draft EIR and the final EIR, but the habitat map is, is not one of those changes. So this is a, uh, the most recent habitat map. And you can see consolidation of habitat over here in West Area B, right? With a little also in South and Southeast Area B. Oh, and, and now's a good time. I have another slide for this, but Area A, where we were on Saturday, right, with the little road here that goes out to the creek and you know the, the, the gas uh, facilities. North area C. Oh, okay. 
on north, I don't know if that was a question, North Area C, South Area C, South Area C is where the baseball fields are, not a typical use inside an ecological reserve. And I think I mentioned on Saturday, you know, we're sort of seeking a, a coexistence where we can also go in and, you know, work with kids to learn about nature um, in a way that doesn't disrupt the, the baseball. Uh, but anyways, that's the, uh, the habitat map. Remember that, because that's going to come back. We're going to talk a little bit about that. A wandering skipper, and I almost always say wandering tattler, which is a bird. I just, you know, get them to the wandering skipper. Uh, skippers are a small type of butterfly. You have fiery skippers, umber skippers, all different kinds of skippers. But the wandering skipper is a state species of, of concern, and it requires salt grass. And that's this images of a wandering skipper on salt grass. That again is a hard dependency. You don't have wandering skippers where you don't have salt grass. And by the way, I meant to say earlier, I'm happy to be corrected on anything because as I, I think I mentioned on Saturday, you know, there are certainly people who just do their thesis on, you know, um, wandering skipper or on salt grass. And so if anyone wants to put into the chat and you have a different perspective on something, let me know. But this is all what I've, you know, gleaned from various readings and especially the state's EIR. This is the wandering skipper habitat. The yellow is assumed occupied. The uh, orange is potentially suitable habitat. Okay. And then we've got the, probably many of you have heard, have heard about the El Segundo blue butterfly. Now this butterfly looks actually like a lot of other butterflies that you might find in the area, but this butterfly is only, it's very localized and it has a dependency on sea cliff buck, buckwheat. And not to be confused with other types of buckwheat like California buckwheat. And there was actually a restoration project. I think I maybe mentioned this to the folks that were there on Saturday, where they accidentally seeded the wrong buckwheat and it bloomed earlier and actually attracted other butterflies and moths that were able to outcompete the El Segundo blue butterfly and actually caused problems. So that's why I have to be really careful when we're designing things and designing plant pallets and whatnot to make sure we get it right. You'll see the page numbers. By the way, I should have mentioned down in the lower right-hand corner, and actually, let me go back up to the wandering. No, I should have pointed this out on this page. So this www.flickr.com slash photos slash Stonebird, that is Jonathan Coffin's Flickr page. And Jonathan is just invaluable to um, people understanding what is currently at the Bionna Wetlands. He goes almost every day. They probably can count on both hands on the number of times in a year that Jonathan does not go down to the Bayana wetlands. He likes to go off in late afternoons. Sometimes he'll be in there in the morning. He likes to go owling at night, takes a lot of pictures of barn owls. He takes pictures of scorpions using infrared light. It's really, really amazing. And if you go there, you'll see he captures everything from the big megafauna, the coyotes and the hawks and the osprey, all the way down to the tiniest little spiders and, and lichens. So um, just wanted to point that out. So if you see his name in a photo, he took it, the unmarked ones I took, I included some of my own, primarily because I want people to know that anybody can go down there. You don't have to be a, a fabulous photographer to go down and appreciate the wildlife. This is the El Segundo blue butterfly habitat. And uh, this is one of my favorite plants. This is the alkali heath. Now we saw this on Saturday. There's actually a lot of pretty sizable patches of this alkali heath, Frankinia. Selena, and um, it doesn't grow in a lot of places. It has to be in sort of a saline environment. So the two places I've seen in Los Angeles County are the Bayona Wetlands and then up in Edwards Air Force Base, up in the desert, there's uh, a population. And so it doesn't grow in the Baldwin Hills. It doesn't grow, you know, in Beverly Hills. And so to me, when we talk about native species and, and the uh, diversity of the vegetation, I think a big thing that think about is what can only grow here and should that not get some kind of priority right so i know a lot of people kind of are pushing back against you know just sort of having a, a binary view of native and non-native and i think that's okay but i think we can still say there's inherent value to native plants especially those that native um, species of wildlife depend on and particularly where they can't grow anywhere else we ought to try to in my view prioritize them over things that can grow anywhere with, with, again, some exceptions, which I'll mention in just a bit. This is also the alkali heath. This is a picture that came after one of the rains and the drops just all collected on the web of a funnel weaver spider. I mentioned on Saturday that the funnel weaver spiders really like to use the alkali heath to make their webs. So I just thought this was a, a, 
a different way of seeing the same plant. And so you'll see sometimes a, multiple pictures of the same thing, but with a different species of wildlife on it from a different angle. Sometimes it's the sunlight, sometimes with the, the Frankenia, the, just the way the salt that's being pulled up from the soil kind of crystallizes and, and just kind of shot, you know, radiates off the plant is, is really fun. This is, um, and I, by the way, I didn't mark these because I just wanted to sort of let, you know, people take them in and maybe think for themselves what that is. But this is Cressa truxalensis. The, the alkali heath and the Cressa are both um, typically found in wetlands. So usually found in wetlands, but not always. The, the um, pickleweed is always found in wetlands. So, so wetland obligate species. Um, these flowers are really tiny. So when, and again, the, on Saturday, this was pretty dried out, all, all the Cressa, but we expect it to rebound. And, you know, maybe in a couple of months, you come back, you'll see, you know, these nice uh, uh, white flowers with the little purple centers. This is golden bush. This is area A. And it's interestingly enough, the only little clump of golden bush that I'm aware of. You go to er area B, there's golden bush all over the place. One of the trails goes right through golden bush when it blooms. You get this smell, this aroma of buttered popcorn. Feels like you're in the theater. Um, this just kind of sprouted up, and you know we're hoping that it spreads. But uh, this is the only area. This is the only one that we were aware of. I mentioned this when we on Saturday. You know we saw what looked like tumbleweed, sort of you know dried out. But deerweed, one of my favorite plants. Again, you can see this up in the Santa Monica Mountains, but you don't see it really just everywhere. It has to be a little bit of of open space. You know, coastal um, chaparral or scrub. And this is yellow-faced bumblebee that's on the deer weed. I just love the orange and yellow together for some, just really find it up uplifting. Um, this is a female hooded oriole in Laurel Sumac. So Laurel Sumac is a native tree and we've got a lot of it at the Bino Wetlands. There's a lot of it in area A, especially in the area that we walk, but also even more in the Southeast corner of area A. And that's an area that is, has quite a lot of native species. And so we're a little concerned again about, you know, some of the plans, do we wipe all that out, um, you know, or is there a way to work around that? Uh, this is also Laurel Sumac. This little bird, not the best picture, but this little bird is a least bells vireo, federally endangered bird. And it sings its heart out from the top of the Laurel Sumac. It prefers willows. It likes riparian habitat. And but it will definitely nest. It also nested in acacia, which is, you know, a, a, non-native tree, not suggesting that we need to grow a lot of acacia to benefit the least bells bureau, because again, their preferred uh, habitat is willow, but they will, again, nest in laurel sumac, and they did nest here for a couple of years. It hasn't been back, I think, in two years. We're hoping with the rain that we got this year that it, that it might come back again. Really uh, energetic song. It just cranks its head back and just sings away. This is coyote brush, and it's, you know, I, I get that the coyote brush is actually in the foreground because I actually like that there's a coyote in the background um, kind of staring at me through the coyote brush. So we do have coyotes, as I mentioned, at the Bino Wetlands. We have rattlesnakes, all sorts of things. And we, you know, we bring kindergartners out there and we know that if we do our jobs, they're not going to go anywhere near a rattlesnake and the, the coyotes aren't going to come anywhere near us. So it's a great way for the kids to learn not to be afraid, but to be respectful, right? to treat wildlife as wildlife, right? It's not a pet, it's not something to go in touch, but you can observe from a distance and, and be safe and respectful. This is another picture of coyote brush with a blue darter dragonfly on top. Um, again, you get a sense here of the sort of, you know, small jaggedy leaves. And then another one, coyote brush, I mentioned the native bees, I think on Saturday, they are probably still underground, the ground nesting bees, but they'll come back and they will use the laurel sumac, they will use the coyote brush, uh, a number of other things, and just really cool. I almost look to me like an alien, that white eye and that sort of metallic green. We have many, many species, too many to count of native bee. People tend to think of, again, just that sort of classic honeybee, European honeybee when they think of a bee. This is a bush tit, one of our smaller birds, little bug in its mouth. And in, unless my memory is failing me, this was on mule fat. You just can't really see the leaves of the mule fat. But this bird, yellow eyes, tells me that it's a female. The males sort of have the darker eyes. The rim of the eyes is, is not as dark as the center. And this, again, another Jonathan Coffin photo is a California thrasher, which we don't get typically at the Bino Wetlands, even though it's very common in the Santa Monica Mountains. We've had one for the last, you know, 
five to 10 years, but it's intermittent. We don't always have it. I haven't actually seen one in about a year, but that is also on mule fat, a native um, kind of, you know, somewhat related to, to willows. And then we have this Gabrielle with some of the students that we brought on a field trip. And that of course is a California sagebrush. She has a great way to communicate with the kids, which is to teach, um, tell something about a plant to one group and say, you're the grandparents. And then the grandparent group has to communicate those same, that same knowledge down to the group that she's said, okay, you're going to be the parents. And then they transfer it again down to the group of um, students that we say, you're going to be the kids. And it's just a fun way for them to think not only about the knowledge that they're getting of the plant, but also this idea of oral tradition and passing along that knowledge. And she does a just fantastic job of weaving that into, you know, a whole story about, you know, some of the, the wrongs of the past and, you know, current efforts to address that. Um, we have the um, orchids yellow pincushion. I'm going to go through some of these quick names, and I'm not going to get to all of our native plants, and I apologize if I missed somebody's favorite, but there's really a lot of native plants. That find it. It's a very, you know, it's not like your typical Santa Monica City Park, which again, those are very important, but one of the things we try to communicate to people is not all parks are created equal. An ecologic reserve is meant to be, you know, more protected than a state park or a city park, and so we do have a lot of stuff that, you know, we think is worthy of protection. This is a um, pygmy blue. It is, it is the smallest butterfly in North America on woolly sea blight. Another really just amazing picture by Jonathan. And then just talking again about some of the threats. This, by the way, is the same slide I used when I spoke to you in 2019. So this is I, mostly new slides, but I reused this one because I thought it was really apt. So again, loss of habitat, always number one. If we lose the habitat, then there's nothing there, right? We have to keep the habitat first and foremost. We never, our organization never considers trading land for money. Even if we think the money can be used for good stuff to, you know, restore one part of the reserve, giving away any more land just is not part of the equation. Um, crowding out by invasive vegetation. Again, I understand that there's different degrees of thought on that, but to me, it's pretty clear that if you've got you know, a field that look, you know, I, again, I understand there's stuff growing in the understory, but basically a, a big expanse of, of mustard, which, you know, can grow in a lot of places or ice plant, that at least we should be moving the needle, right, towards these natives. Illicit activity. So we've had a number, it was constant dumping. We've had, I think, five fires in the last three, maybe four years. Encampments, motor bikes, dirt bikes. Again, on the encampments, we understand that it's a complex issue. We have found, so A, just as a human being, right? We think what's the ecological impact, but also what's the social impact, right? That's important. But even ecologically, we found that if you just push people out, you know, without, without a thought as to what the long-term strategy is, it's not sustainable, right? They, 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 they go somewhere, right? And so we are um, really looking forward to seeing again on, on Jefferson, certainly the, those RVs located to a place that's safer and more sanitary for them, and also where you know, there's gonna be less ecological damage. And then other disturbances. And then I put in yellow, lack of tidal influence. And I did that because that's one of the big um, premises of you know, the large scale restoration. And you know, I think there's some different opinions on that. We'll, we'll try to get into a little of those. All right, so now non-native plants at Bayonne, right? This is kind of the reckoning. And I think that some people who came on Saturday, I hope everyone knew what they were getting themselves into on Saturday. Um, that you were going to see a lot of non-natives, right? And this is a bench and a interpretive sign. Again, we talked about the interpretive signs don't really tell you anything about what you're going to see when you go. Um, and it could, you know, it indicate what's there now in terms of some of the non-natives, but also some of the birds that we saw. I don't know if we saw the Harrier, I think we did, um, coursing over or Mount Baldy in the background. There's a lot that we can talk to people about today. But what you're mostly seeing here is crown daisy, a little bit of ice plant down at the bottom and lots and lots of mustard. Not to mention again, we talked about the palm trees. The palm trees, you know, the, the owls love palm trees, hooded orioles love palm trees, hawks love palm trees. But you can see there's some that are spreading out into, you know, an area that we would probably like to preserve for the other plants. So we, we have probably a lot of palm trees. And that's one that I think you see rooted in a lot of literature. A lot of organizations will say, 
hey, we're not going to try to eradicate the palm trees, but we're going to definitely manage them. We're going to contain them. We're just not going to let them run amok. So at Biota, sometimes it seems like we get the uh, almost the worst of both worlds where some are getting chopped down that are harboring really good species educationally and ecologically, and others are being left to expand. Not always a lot of rhyme or reason. Um, this is one of the ecological reserve signs. You know, it's, it's um, I, I want to note that there is a number of field staff for Department of Fish and Wildlife. Every time I see them, they're working really hard. So it's it's not like, you know, they, they don't have enough to do. They, they're working really hard. But it's a big reserve, right? It's 577 acres. It's in the middle. It's, you know, it's a very urbanized environment where there are a lot of constant pressure. So when a face, sign like this gets to face, this has been this way for about a month. You know, we try, it's, 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 it's hard to keep communicating because sometimes the communication doesn't get uh, come back from management, but to say, hey, can we go out and clean this sign, right? Not, hey, the sign's dirty, someone needs to clean this, but can we go out and clean the sign and also take care of this castor bean that's growing right at the base of this ecological reserve sign? And they did a little bit of work on it, but again, they have so much to do, right? There's every day, there's something new that's coming up, dumping or whatever. So, you know, really, part of the conversation tonight is what can we do to break that impasse so that the Department of Fish and Wildlife says, and not just for the land trust, right? We'd, we'd actually, if we need to step to the side, you know, we would, but that the community in general can say, hey, we want to help make this ecologic reserve more ecologically healthy. H how can we work together to do that? Um, you can probably identify a lot of you what these are, but I just thought when I took this picture, that was interesting. We had three bands of different invasive uh, vegetation. It's kind of hard to tell in the foreground. I, I still haven't learned how to you know, do the uh, depth of field with my camera, but this is radish. And then behind it, this sort of light green is Euphorbia terracina. And then behind that, pretty sure is rip gut brome. Sometimes the grasses kind of you know, can, can blend together a little bit. Um, this was actually in the middle of an existing restoration area. And so we also have an issue with when we do restoration in small areas, they tend to be big budget you know, grant, you know, publicly funded things, which seems to be that the grant process is you got to spend it all at once. What we get is we get this big rip out of everything that's there without necessarily all the planning having gone into what's going to replace it, right? Do we have native plants in a nursery standing by? Do we already have the seed collected? Do we have a plan as to how we're going to, you know, revegetate the area? In this case, that really wasn't the case. And so still some areas struggling because of that. You can see they put in a new fence. Uh, I mentioned a little bit to the er, to the early comers on Saturday. This fence, I think, cost about $160,000. It came from a fire resiliency fund. And the idea was the fence would prevent people from going out into the ecological reserve and starting a fire. Again, understanding as somebody who goes there three to four times a week and just always looking and noticing where the holes in the fence are, I don't think this fence is, is, is going to do anything. And, and I would have really have loved to have seen that money spent on actually reducing the fuel load, right? Actually getting rid of some of that mustard and some of that crown daisy. Because then not only do you have a reduced fire risk, but you, you're improving the ecology. The fence really didn't, you know, it's got, a, a, I think about 35 of the posts have two foot holes filled with concrete. Um, so, and we weren't really informed about it at the time, it was a little frustrating. This other ecologic reserve sign, Again, you got some pompous grass and some uh, ice plants. And then, you know, I, I mentioned the trash. The trash is a tough one, right? Because it's, it's getting dumped pretty much every day. But I think with more community involvement, right? If people were helped to think of this as a community natural resource, I think we could um, work better to prevent this kind of illegal dumping. And in the background, you can see the water. We're, we'll talk about the south area, uh, southeast area A and B. Um, I'm going to try to keep cruising through here. Keep an eye on my time. We love bringing the kids out and using the microscopes. We have a little watershed model for the younger kids, and they can see how the water rushes down. And if you litter in one spot, it's going to wash down 130 square mile watershed. So we remind them, hey, if you see a styro styrofoam cup, that doesn't mean somebody threw a styrofoam cup right there. They might have. That might have blown off a table, you know, at a coffee shop in in you know Brentwood and gone into the, you know, the water system and blown down into the creek. Uh, but I have this here because you know we've got uh, a lot of pickleweed, uh, sorry, uh, ice plants in the background there. 
this is actually the same place I was talking to you about before. This sign, you can't read it because it's covered up with you know all the stuff that's growing in front of it. It actually says, please stay on the trail, restoration of progress. You know, part of I think, you know, the, the tension is we have these projects funded with big grants again that don't necessarily follow up. They don't necessarily follow through. And so we find ourselves in a position of having to try to you know, cajole a little bit and say, hey, you need to get some folks back out there because if you just leave it like this, all the work you've done, the, the native plants that are growing there, they're just going to get out-competed again. And then I just wanted to show, you know, again, this is in the background, that same crown daisy, that same mustard, it's beautiful in the spring. And that's okay. It's okay that people who are riding their bikes down the bike trail get excited. We don't want to dampen their excitement. We want them to get excited that, you know, they're seeing this beautiful field of, of yellow. But then we want to help educate them about, hey, what if it was more, you know, native plants that are also beautiful and color, colorful, you know, but we have to make that connection first. And so the uh, lower left-hand corner is an, an anis swallowtail butterfly like sweet fennel. This one happens to be on uh, crown daisy. And then you can see in the other corners, you know, a lot of the words browned up and a little bit more desiccated. Okay, so now shifting real quick. There are some times that we have stepped up and said, hey, we think that this non-native plant should stay. This palm tree, Canary Island date palm in the background was one of those examples because for one, it makes a great classroom. It's just the shade, and especially on a hot day. Um, you see here two docents from LA Audubon. I work with these folks, Cindy Harden and uh, Martine, two of my favorite docents. And it's just a nice peaceful place for the kids, an outdoor classroom to think a little bit about you know, nature. And we do have barn owls, at least one, uh, roosting, and we think quite, pro quite possibly nesting. It's hard to know when they're nesting. Right? There's certain clues that you have to, have to look for, but we definitely have scat and owl pellets below. The kids love, we grab an owl pellet, we break it open, they see the bones, the skulls of a bodice pocket gopher or you know, a mouse or what have you. And we, then we get to talk about the ecology, that you know, wh why do owls need pellets? And we talk about the difference between hawks you know, that sometimes can use their sharp claws and talons, sharp talons and build, a, you know, rip out the meat, whereas the owls eat their prey whole. So we get to get into that and they get very excited about that. This was a barn owl. This one is, this is a fledgling barn owl. So we know with high probability that it nested or sort of fledged either in this tree or one of two very nearby trees. These trees are slated for removal, but we were able to get a stay of about nine years before they get chopped down. And what we're hoping is, is in that nine years, this kind of fever for cutting these trees down, maybe will dissipate, or maybe some of the new stuff that gets planted will come in and, and then you know we'll have something to replace it with. Um, although there aren't many things that are structured like a Canary Island date palm tree for the owls. Okay, and then the eucalyptus, right? We talked about this. So this is a eucalyptus grove. Again, Jonathan Coffin goes into the eucalyptus grove. He calls it the owl sanctum because we also have great horned owls there. We also, by the way, have burrowing owls. And every now and again, we'll have a short-eared owl will come and grace us with its presence. That happens maybe you know once or twice every 10 years. But these monarch butterflies are really reliant now on eucalyptus trees and other non-native pine trees for their wintering roosts, right? So if we snapped our fingers Thanos style and they were all gone, that would be a really bad thing. And my first question when I heard that was, how can that be? They must have used something else beforehand. But those trees that they used beforehand probably aren't going to come back, right? So the soil has changed. The amount of contiguous land has changed. So many things have changed that it's hard for that stuff. Um, now, so this is a flyer that was put out in 2016 by one of the organizations that has, you know, received a lot of funding from the Coastal Conservancy to sort of promote this project. And... I don't necessarily disagree with much on the slide. There's, you know, I think maybe overplaying a certain set of points here, but really the issue is what's what's the plan to address this, right? And I, I enlarged a couple pieces, right? So one is if you look at the different plants, and I, hopefully you can see the full screen. It's not getting blocked by the zoom controls, but uh, you know, mustard you saw, castor bean you saw, crown daisy you saw, ice plant you saw, euphorbia you saw. The only thing we didn't see in area A was a rundo. I'd actually say that the wetlands, pompous grass would probably maybe take that spot. Um, but they say it's getting worse as of 2013. So that, they did a comparison between 2006, 2013, you know, getting worse, which isn't surprising because there's no effort 
to address it. And our organization used to, we used to be allowed to go in and do stewardship in area C. And so we would go around the baseball fields, around some other areas. And if there was you know, a lot of castor bean or you know, whatever it was, mustard, we could clear that out. We had permission to do that. Um, we lost that permission in 2013 when the Annenberg Foundation wanted to build a 46,000 square foot domestic dog and cat center that they were calling Urban Ecological Reserve. But then when they actually built it, it's called Annenberg Pet Space. It's in Playa Vista. And that is when I quit my job, my corporate job, to go full time because I could not keep up with all the PR from various nonprofits and, and agencies that were trying to push this as a, an urban ecology center when you know, every bit of evidence was that it was, it was going to be an adoption center for dogs and cats, which, by the way, ironically, is a cause that I'm also really committed to, just not in an ecological center. But anyways, we lost our, um, our permission and we haven't gotten it back. And we think that whether it's us or, you know, who doesn't matter who it is, but if you look at this lower thing, you look at all the red and the yellow, right? That's bad, you know? And then you look at all the green and that's the native. It's the areas north of the creek and north of Jefferson, you know, in the Eastern part of area B that's screaming out for attention. And those are the areas that we're not allowed to do anything, which is again, a little bit, um, you know, seems to me to be counterintuitive. And so down at the bottom, it says, this shows that if we do nothing, we are harming the system. So just to be clear to everybody, we are doing nothing. We are harming the system, right? It just, it, it could not be more clear. Again, there are a couple, you know, down in the West area B, there are some um, programs down in the Southwest corner of um, South area B and a little bit in Southeast area B where they're doing a little bit with pompous grass. But for the most part, nothing north of the Creek that I'm aware of other than staff every now going out especially if we you know, kind of say, hey, can you take care of this? But th that's not the kind of effort we need. We really need an all hands on deck. We need that when a school, say a college group or Cub Scouts or a church, whoever says, we have 40 volunteers, can we come and help? We don't have to say, well, we're booked through whenever because we only have a few programs going on. We say, absolutely, there's room for you to come out and help transform this, this ecosystem. Again, being gentle, and I want to point out that that's where the tribal knowledge comes in because the last thing we want to do, and this happened once, some people are a little over aggressive. There was a Brazilian pepper that they wanted to take out. They went too deep and the tribal consultant the, um, you know, wasn't happy and rightfully so. And so we all need to learn and be, gen and be careful and make sure we're not overstepping. And obviously anything that would be done would be done with the guidance of the uh, Department of Fish Wildlife. Okay, so very quickly, what's the biggest obstacle in our view to this is that virtually all resources for the last 18 years have been consumed by a planning process for a large scale restoration proposal that whether you like it or don't like it, we think we have just ample evidence that it's not going to be implemented. And so that's a problem for us. We think there's a lot of political pressure to get something done and to sort of have you know, a groundbreaking ceremony to sort of just and, and then kind of say, well, we did it. But that's pretty misleading and I'll explain why. We talked about the areas of the ecological reserve. One thing I'll say quickly is there's a lot of talk about SoCal gas. I think, frankly, you know, both sides kind of exaggerate their, their point a little bit, if I'm, if I'm being honest. Um, I don't believe that SoCal gas came up with the idea for the restoration. I don't think it's all for them, but I absolutely 100% think because it's in their own records that they need to upgrade their infrastructure, right? They have to do it. And they saw an opportunity with the restoration to piggyback on that. So they're saying, well, we'll take out all our stuff and that'll help you restore. And then we'll just do new slant drilling you know, on our property. Well, there are concerns with that. I'm torn, right? I would love for all the gas infrastructure to be out of the wetlands. I'm torn at this stage of letting them just completely upgrade their infrastructure. And to the one extent, those are two separate issues, but they've linked them together. And so one you know, question we always ask is, well, if you're willing to do that, why don't you do it now? Why would you wait until sometime in the future, do it now because it's good to get that stuff out of there, even if we didn't do, you know, even if we did the no project alternative. So there's a little bit more to be said there. Um, this is the timeline for the restoration. It's not the current timeline, it's the timeline that this map I think was first made in 2004. And you see approvals and perm permits, phase one implementation was set to begin at the end of 2007. You see down at the bottom, this is from a Coastal Conservancy memo. Restoration planning is expected to take three years and cost up to $2 million. So that was just way off, right? And so here we are in 2023. Now 
we had to really probe to get the information that now they think the budget is an additional, they've already spent 15 million about, and they needed an additional seven to 9 million more to finish the planning process. And they don't have an estimate. We were told, finally got an answer on that. They do not have any estimate now as to when that will be. So we went from three years, $2 million in 2004, and now we're in 2023 and it's, and it's an additional seven to 9 million and they don't even know when that's gonna happen. So to us, that's a red flag of saying, okay, well, let's not wait for that then to, before we start doing stuff about native plants. Just a couple quick slides, 2005, you know, this thing started off as um, a joint effort between the Santa Monica Bay Restoration Commission and the US Army Corps of Engineers. They abandoned that effort in 2012 and sort of took a different route to it. But at the time, it was actually gonna be larger than just the wetlands. It was gonna include a lot of the adjacent, you know, ecosystems. I'm going to start going quickly because I know I'm starting to run out of time. And um, the, so this is a different view of the same thing. You can see the orange. So the Biona wet, oops, didn't mean to do that. The Biona wetlands, Biona wetlands, but also up the creek all the way to where it gets daylighted at basically around Venice Boulevard, Sentinella Creek, and a couple other places. And this I thought was really interesting. Again, I hope you can see the full slide that says it takes a village. And then there were all these elected officials, all these different organizations. And unfortunately, that village has kind of walked away from Biona. Everybody has kind of said, you know what? Why do I even want to touch this? Because it makes me uncomfortable. And my message to them always is it's not about you. If you're a public official or you know, whatever your, your situation is, and, and you, you, you feel that Biona is just a bunch of people bickering, figure out a way to work around those people if, if you think that's a problem. But don't just sacrifice an entire ecosystem because you're uncomfortable, you know, in a controversial setting. We've we've got to fix that, or we're not going to fix this problem. I mean, it's been going on for 20 years. It'll go on for another 20 years. But as I mentioned, my daughter, right? She's 11 and a half now. I guarantee you, she's going to be in her 20s before we get any kind of mechanized restoration here. So we better figure out something in the meantime. This is the plan that they eventually boiled it down to. So in 2012, they had a $6.25 million to design all this stuff. You see, you know, they talk a lot about the meandering creek that a lot of people have pointed out sounds just like jargon. Like what, what, what does that mean? That what's the benefit of meandering? It's still going to be encased in uh, armored, our armored levees, which is not as high. You'll hear sometimes the term concrete levee. That's not true. They're earthen levees down where the, re where the restoration, where the project would happen. They do have stone pavers. They have a little bit of gunite near the top, but you'll see the, the banks of the creek are lined with both native and non-native vegetation. But again, we can improve that with a little bit of stewardship. Um, so what's wrong with that project? Well, first of all, if you look at this, and if you ever come on a, a tour of Area B, you'll see this is an iconic view of the wetlands. This is a tidal slough. It's a historic tidal channel. And unfortunately, they designed the projects that the levees they wanted to reroute them would go straight over this historic marsh channel. It's not just that it's beautiful, it's that the vegetation on either side, that is endangered ha the ha habitat for endangered building and a sparrow. You hear some people say, well, that could get fixed during the permit process. We need to be really clear that they spent, you know, 17 years and 15 million, you know, $12 million is spending the rest of that now to, to finalize and certify an EIR. The California Environmental Equality Act, so, uh, CEQA, that's the whole, that's, that's it. You get to your final certified EIR. Yeah, you still got to go through the Coastal Commission, but that's not when you're supposed to be tinkering with something as major as where a levy is going to go. So, you know, the, we talked about litigation before. We begged them not to certify the EIR. We said, do not certify this. You don't have the flood control right. We'll get into that in a second. Just wait, fix the problems, work with us. And they didn't do it. They certified it certified it, that gave us 30 days. If we did not file a lawsuit within 30 days, we would lose any right to challenge the project. I am not gonna sit back on a project that looks to extirpate building Savannah Sparrow, right? it's counterintuitive. So we did, we filed the lawsuit. And I just wanna note again, you know, I'm, friends of mine in Wetlands have been around longer than we have. And when they started out, I always thank Ruth Lans uh, Lansford, who's their, their founder, because in 1978, when I was you know still a kid, she, made this happen, right? She was the one who got the ball rolling to save this land. I will always be thankful to her for that, always. However, you know, we struggle now. We oftentimes are, for whatever reason, on opposite sides of conservation issues, like the Annenberg Foundation thing and the, the a big parking garage that they wanted to build, build in Area A. But they did not support the West Area B levy going over that tidal slough any more than we did. We talked about extreme measures, ecologically responsible. 
does not support, they did not support full title. And you can go to this link and just try to shorten it for you. Tinyurl.com, F-O-B-W-E-I-R. And just, you know, read it. Don't take my interpretation of it. Read it. And, you know, I think this is the kind of discussion we need to have, though, because I think they saw the same thing we did, right? This was a clunker and, you know, we needed to do something about it. So let's talk about sea level rise real quick. So this is a, this map is a mythical habitat. This is never going to exist because this is meant to be sometime before 2030, but some, but sometime after the project is completed and before sea level rise starts to have an impact, right? But the project's not going to be completed by 2030. It's so much behind schedule. So what you see here is a lot of, this is when they talk about, we're going to create, you know, 70 plus net acres of Bellingsen Sparrow habitat. That's all this dark and middle green, medium green stuff. But look what happens by 2030. Remember we showed you the, I showed you the map of the building Sphenosphero, the primary habitat. It goes to light green. Well, so what? It's still green, right? Well, low marsh is not really what building Sphenosphero likes. They like the mid to high marsh. And you see, we already have it disappearing in 2030, seven years from now. Project won't even be started probably by 2030. Then we have 2050. Now we've got the red, right, mudflat, so unvegetated, and we've got a little bit of low marsh, very little bit of high marsh. Yeah, there's little bands of high marsh, and then there's a lot over in uh, south and southeast area B, but remember, this was the primary breeding habitat, and then it just gets from there, right, 2070 and uh, 2100. Now, if you've ever seen a group that's pro a proponent of this project, they'll show you these same maps, and while they're showing you these maps, this is what I have always <laughs> struggled to understand, they say this project was designed to accommodate sea level rise. You can see that the marsh transgressing up slope, transgressing up, it's disappearing. Now, and these aren't meant to be Rorschach tests, right? It's not that I see disappearing coastal marsh and somebody else sees, you know, butterfly morphing from green to, to red. This is not okay. And I just, I would challenge anybody to explain where on this slide is the building Santa Sparrow habitat? Where's the South Coast Marshville habitat? the wandering skipper habitat. It just goes away. That's why we sued, right? I just want to be clear, everyone. It's not because we didn't like, you know, that they were using bulldozers. We, we, we're more of an outcome-oriented uh, organization. We don't like this outcome. Okay, and then the flood control, they got it absolutely wrong. They were supposed to do it for 68,000 cubic feet per second. They did it for 46,000 cubic feet per second. It was a miscommunication. I will say, I think they spent less time getting this right than like I check the grocery list before I go get groceries and I'll go back and say, oh, let me look again, see what's on there. This was a personal communication between the US Army Corps of Engineers and a consultant at ESA that never got vetted. I mean, the information's out there. You can just Google the flood control and you'll see all kinds of information that should have indicated that 46,000 cubic feet per second was not the right number, but they spent uh, millions of dollars on that. And now you can see, you know, there's this whole thing about what do you have left up your sleeve? I'll get into that. That's their wording, not mine. That's them talking internally. How do we get around this? And they, in the, in the draft EIR, did something you're just not allowed to do, which is they swept it under the rug. In this state, if you're a real estate agent, right, and you know a house has termites, you've got to disclose that to the buyer. If you don't, you could lose your license. We need to have the same level, right, of, of candor for this major public process. If you know there's a flood control issue and you're about to publish a draft EIR, you better let people know, hey, there was a mistake. There was a miscommunication. We're going to have to go back and redo some of this stuff. They didn't do that. Um, lots of unresolved questions about, again, you know, see Lewis's evening primrose, not really sure, you know, what's going to happen to it. Um, one, one real quick thing, and I'm trying to wind down here, is that where it says, this is really big. This was an, an appendix. It says, in areas which will be excavated and reused, it may be necessary to remove invasive species prior to excavation. So to the extent that people, and a lot of people do this in their presentations, try to make it seem like, hey, there's all these invasive species. That's why we're going to get the bulldozers to come in and, and take it all away. And just real quick, a long, long, long time ago, I was a platoon leader in a totally non-combat construction battalion. So I know heavy equipment. I know that bulldozers is often just a sort of an umbrella for things like graders and scrapers and rollers and you name it. But this is really key because what they're saying is you can't just scrape the stuff away, right? Because if you do that, you're probably going to be propagating it. So we need to be doing this anyways. We need to have a program in place to start converting to native species, if nothing else, and to make the seed bank healthier for when we do, if and when we do this larger project. 
Um, additional concerns, I'm not gonna go all through all these. This is again, this is another one of the slides from last time. But I said at the time in 2019, I said budget and timeline likely underestimated. We've confirmed that it was absolutely underestimated. Okay, so you the binary sequences one and two, again, remember the area that was green had a lot of natives. That is for whatever reason why they're not, where they're now prioritizing all of their efforts. And the problem for us is a couple of things. One is you see this little red culvert over to the left. They want to let more water through here so that it can come and then you know do its do its magic down here. The problem is this salt pan is also very sensitive habitat. It says right in the EIR that a risk to the salt pan is rising uh, water levels. So much so that they actually added, LA Audubon was the first one to notice that and say, hey, you can't just sacrifice the salt pan. And so to mitigate that, they decided they would build a berm around the salt pan. But the berm isn't part of sequences one and two. So once again, we think that kind of is a rush to do something and they never consulted with anybody, right? Before they, on April Fool's Day, no less, put out this plan. And it was only after they put it out that they started having conversations with people, no meetings yet, just phone calls. Um, but yeah, so that was one of the concerns. This is the area, right? And so one of them, when they, when they announced this, they said um, an area of the ecological reserve, and I actually can't read it because it's behind my zoom controls, but basically saying starved from its water source for many decades. Now, it's just not true, right? Go down there, go down there tomorrow and park behind those RVs, right? This is a great egret flying over a bunch of different ducks. We got some gadwall and some northern shelvers and probably some other stuff mixed in. And this is all pickweed. The only vegetation you can see here is pickweed. Now that's not all of South and Southeast area B, but it's a big expanse of it. I don't know anybody that would look at the vegetation maps and say, this is where we need to go first. We think they did it because they really want something mechanized. They want to get some equipment out there and have a groundbreaking ceremony. Um, and this is right from the EIR. This talks about what is the water source, right? What is the water source that this area has supposedly been started from, even though we now know it's full of water? And it's the freshwater marsh, interestingly enough, right? So you hear a lot of people talk about, oh, the freshwater marsh, it's, it's a really great thing. I like to go there. I like the bird watch there for sure. Um, but they're now saying that's what actually is choking off the water from this area, even though we see that it's got water in there. So you can read this again. I'm always happy to provide links after the fact if you want to go and read this stuff, all from the draft yard. None of this is just, you know, any me or anyone else just thinking what our opinion is. We really like to go off of their science. Now, this is also South uh, East Area B, right? Now, you look at this, it doesn't look nearly as good as that last slide, but you see like four patches of vegetation here. Two of these patches of vegetation are native. A lot of people look at this and they see the brown. And they're like, oh, what's this? Well, that's pickleweed, right? And this is, uh, there's a lot of uh, salt grass in here. This is the ice plant. What a lot of people might look at and see this you know, really green, think this must be the healthiest part. And then we got some desiccated mustard. So, and then you got the SoCal gas, very expansive facility. You can see it at the base. They take up a lot of room that we'd love someday to see go back to being part of the ecological reserve or part of the wetlands. And then they, uh, the whole hillside, and then they've got a big uh, processing plant. Okay, so very quickly, to us, this is like the difference between a road trip to Mexico City, right? Which, hey, you might go through Carlsbad and Chula Vista. Those might be your first two stops on the way to Mexico City. But if you don't have passports, and if you don't have any money, and, and you actually can't cross the border, to say, hey, we're, we're still doing the road trip to Mexico City, everyone, be excited. We're just starting with the first two legs. To us, that's just dishonest. And it's, and, it, and it's problematic because the things that they were saying were really important. Why we desperately needed to do this project, sea level rise, public access. Let, let's go to the next slide here. So this is the public access plan. I put no new public ahead of that because remember, this is where they're doing the project down here in South and Southeast area B. No access was planned for that area. And they've been open about that. But they're saying, well, you know what? We might consider access now. This plan took like 15 years to make. And so deeply troubled that there's now no public access plan. We're glad we got those gates open. And then sea level rise. Remember we talked about, you know, West Area B where all the Bellingsman and Sparrow are breeding. And they're saying that by 2050, this is what it looks like with the project. And they're saying without, it, without doing anything, it's going to be even worse. Well, that time is going to go by very quickly. And I'm really close to the end of my slide. Again, go back to that vegetation slide, right? Nothing happening in Area A and Area C. When will something happen in Area A and Area C? If we stick to this mantra of wait for the restoration, 10 years, 20 years, a long time from now, and damage is being done, there's actually been a, a measured loss of delineated wetlands in area A, and in part due to 
those the tall mustard and crown daisy, um, you know, bringing the water out and then it uh, uh, evaporating into the air. Okay, um, kind of just a tongue in cheek slide, right? Why do they want the, this big mechanized thing so badly? And it's kind of like if you went to your doctor and the doctor said, let's start with expensive high-risk surgery that requires a long recovery time. If that doesn't work, we can try exercise and a healthier diet. You just wouldn't do them in that order. And so the nice thing about you know, the healthy exercise and diet is it doesn't mean that you can't get surgery, right? We know that this sort of surgical approach isn't going to happen for many, many years. Why are we not doing the sort of the diet and exercise approach in the meantime, which would be, you know, stewardship, going out and gently, you know, but, but steadily increasing the, the percent um, of native cover. And then uh, this will come to uh, later. I'd have to spend just a second on this. If you go to our website, biona.org, go to projects and you click on Biona Creek Infrastructure Data Map. I just, because I'd mentioned this on the field trip. And it'll take you to, you scroll down, it'll give you a little Google map box. And if you click on the expand button, you can go right here. And uh, if you click on one of these buttons, it'll tell you like every bit of infrastructure all along the creek from where it gets daylighted at Venice Boulevard um, all the way down to, uh, to the ocean. Okay, and this is my question slide. Um, and so I will open it up there for questions. And while we wait for questions, I am going to show just three slides that I had at the end. These were also Jonathan Coffin pictures. Yellow crowned night heron eating a crab, American kestrel, our smallest falcon, and a, uh, a I guess this is a green darner um, dragonfly. So just uh, wonder if I had those in reserve, I figured I might as well show them. Any questions, Snowdy, that uh, I wasn't looking at the chat? Well, one just came in from Bill Neal. Uh, who is driving the large 15 plus year restoration? CDFW or Army Corps or Coastal Commission or who? Okay, so CDFW, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, owns the land. They're the lead agency and they have been playing an active role for, I would say, about the last 10 years. But prior to that, they weren't really very active. And it was mostly the Santa Monica Bay Restoration Commission, which has unfortunately completely walked away from the project. They, they kind of have disavowed their involvement. But it was really them working with the Coastal Conservancy. The Coastal Conservancy, not commission, two different agencies. The Coastal Conservancy is essentially a state bank, an a bank for environmental funds. And they fund a lot of really good stuff. But they're also extremely powerful and they got themselves into a situation, I think, that now they're, they're exercising that power to, to, to kind of prevent anyone from kind of questioning what's going on. But CDFW is the, they're the ones who call the shots now. So if you wanted to do a program, for instance, you know, you would contact them. Richard Brody is the land manager. And then he's got a chain of command that goes all the way up to Chuck Bonham, who's the director of uh, Fish and Wildlife. The, the region headquarters is down in San Diego. Um, and so that a lot of Brody's upper management is, is down in San Diego. Hope that answers that question. Oh, and sorry, just real quick. U.S. Army Corps of Engineers really only cares about the flood control, right? So they have to do what's called a federal EIS, Environmental Impact Statement, to go with the Environmental Impact Report, which is the, the state report. So NEPA, National Environmental Protection Act, is the federal equivalent of CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act. But they are not proponents. They have said, look, we're not pushing this project. And in fact, right now, every time I contact them, they kind of say, hey, stop bugging us. There's nothing in front of us. In 2013, there was something in front of them because there's something called the 408 permit, federal permit that the Army Corps of Engineers grants. And there was a submittal A, it's a three submittal process that got submitted. The county looked at it and said, hey, this looks good. They forwarded it along. And the, the county flood control district is basically the local sponsor. And they have to approve it before it goes to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. In 2021, they had to resubmit it because of the flood control discrepancy. This time, the county got it. And 11 months later, they gave four pages of notes saying, look, we're not approving this until you do these things. And then 11 months after that, Fish and Wildlife came back and tried to push back on some of those things. And now it's been three months. So you see, it's a very long process. But right now, there's nothing before U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. They don't consider themselves engaged uh, right now in any capacity, other than maybe some permits for that sequence is one or two. All right, kind of long-winded, sorry. Uh, any other questions? Um, did the LA Pet Shelter get built? It did. It is, if you look up Annenberg Pet Space, you will find it and it's in Playa Vista, right? Which is a better place for it. And 
you know, we're happy that they got to build it. It's a really good cause. But no, they did not. They first tried to build it in Palos Verdes and they got pushed back from the National Park Service because they're like, well, we gave that land for open space, not for a dog and cat adoption center. And then for some reason, they looked on Google Maps to find other open space and they came here. Two years, lots and lots of time and money. Um, it was a real, real unfortunate, again, behind closed doors for about 16 months before they announced it. Then two years after that, it was just a whirlwind and we finally got them to realize that it was the wrong place. And again, they were couching it as an urban ecology center. And it really was concerning for us that the Department of Fish and Wildlife was going along with that. And we, you know, we've got the pictures of, they clearly, the Annenberg Foundation is a lot of great stuff, right? The, the pool, the, the photo space, um, they did not understand ecology and, the, and the, the schematics that they drew up showed that. And so um, now that they built it outside of an ecological reserve, right? They, dispensed with the pretense of it being an urban ecology center and they just said what it is right which is a pet adoption center okay Next so question. It's, it's not in it's not in the wetlands it's, it's not in the wetlands but but it, it, it was look governor brown who was good friends and probably still is with wallace annenberg we were told by people hey you're wasting your time fighting this the governor's behind it everyone's behind it it's a billion dollar philanthropy you're not going to win and it was tough and it you know turned my life upside down to be honest um I did a lot of work at three in the morning and a lot of other people did too, but we, we did win that fight. We also won the fight to, to keep out a parking garage, a three-story parking garage, which would have been the first such structure in any ecological reserve in the state of California, there are about 138 uh, ecological reserves. So, so we do win, we do win actually, more, we have a pretty good track record, but we have to really, like a puffer fish, make ourselves big when the moment calls for it. Um, any other questions? Um, yes, if you had full control of the restoration project, what would be your uh, project uh, design? If I had full control of the restoration project, to be perfectly honest, I would give that full control to someone like Gabrielle. I'm not in this. I do not value my opinion above anyone else's. I want something that my daughter and even more importantly, other people in her generation that have less access to, to nature. Um, I think Gabrielle and, uh, and folks like her would design an excellent Margot Griswold, who is a PhD restoration ecologist, um, who you know has no financial incentive in this game. She also just wants to see a good reserve. I would let those people make the decision. All I care about is that the decision is made in earnest, right? People can have different opinions. What drives me a little nuts is when people spin the facts for, for some other agenda. That's what happened with Annenberg, right? It was they're trying to couch it as something it wasn't. And a lot of times what we get is, well, look at the invasive species. Uh, I'll tell you, the biggest thing was access, right? We were, we were told, you're not getting access till we do our project, right? Live with it. If you want access, support the project. And we just stuck to our guns. We finally got those gates open, but the baseball fields are still closed. I can't get in there. I, to my knowledge, Gabrielle can't get in there to teach a class. And then there's Cabor Road right above the wetlands. It's got the do not trespass signs. That's a paved road. So they could open that gate. There's all kinds of opportunity for, for ecologically and culturally sensitive access on existing roads. You're not gonna be harming any you know, uh, habitat. Um, and that's the kind of thing where when they try to link it to something, that, that's where we get involved. But no, we're not trying to push our particular opinion on anyone. So didn't mean to dodge that question. I love birds, so you know I want to see habitat for birds. But there's all different kinds of habitat for different kinds of birds. There's going to be winners and losers, right? White-tailed kite, osprey, different habitat. California gnat catcher, slightly different habitat than least spells vireo. Um, it just has to be an honest process. Sorry, next question. And by the way, if you want to ask that same question to Gabrielle, you can if she's still on the line. But that's up to her. She might have dropped off to the kids to bed. Well, there's another, there's a question. If this is a wetland, where will the water come from? If this is a sealed off inlet? Um, Great question. So I am torn. And a lot of, you know, again, there are, this whole thing is a spectrum of opinion. And I challenge sometimes, you know, not, not like aggressively, but like, because I'm learning, right? I still want to learn. And I'll ask Margo. Margo will say, you know, this is all, this is fresh water. There's water right below the surface. That's why you're seeing certain plants and animals here. I'm trying to learn more about that, but I'll ask questions. I'll say, well, you know, but what if we wanted more habitat for building Spinosphere, right? Could we get that? There's a little bit of pickle we growing in that parking lot, but wouldn't we need like to change the topography to get more of that? 
And then the answer I often get is, well, you know, Bellingson a sparrow has rebounded dramatically from its low number. That's not a species that's actually going down at Biona. Um, but there is a little inlet called Fiji sluice. There is already some water. It's tidally influenced. It's, you know, it's not a lot. Um, down the road, once we clear away all this dust and we sort of go back to the table, back to the drawing board, and I get some heat for this, right? Because a lot of people who have been fighting for this land for years, I've been doing it for 21 years and people tell me I'm a newcomer and they're right. But a lot of people really are adamant that they don't want that disturbed because they think that is the natural environment. But if we saw, you know, a channel coming off of Fiji Slough, we'd look at it, you know, I think that the, um, the approach that we took in 2012, we did a position paper and we said the extent that heavy equipment is needed because we wanted to clarify, because a lot of people said that we were just adamantly opposed to bulldozers, which is not fully true. We don't like this plan. But we said, you know, look, if there's a, if there's an, a scientifically defensible need to alter the topography, then let's look at that. But you don't need to do that to remove trash. You don't need to do that to remove invasive species. You don't need to do that for access. And that was the three things we kept hearing of, as to why you had to do it. So... Um, again, where you know where, where the water, the groundwater, seasonal wetlands. Right now, they are classified as a depressional, you know, seasonal wetland, and so that's why you've got like the blue elderberry, you know, tree, um, and and, and the, the alkali heath, and the um, you know the cressa. We would like to see how far can we push the envelope. A, since nothing's happening anyways, right? That's the key. It's, it'd be one thing if the bulldozers were ready to go in there tomorrow and the plan was all set, and we were saying, hold, hold up, stop. Give us five years. Um, that's not the case, right? We know it's going to be a long time. It's been 18 years, or well, 20 years since we acquired the property. It's really a shame that we weren't doing this community restoration right up front. Let's see how far we can push the needle, and then and then we'll go from there. Um, mainly, I'm I'm getting comments. One comment uh, regarding monarchs preferring eucalyptus. Um, basically, uh, this comment is that if given the option, monarchs would prefer native conifers. And so that if native yeah, conifers were, were planted, then there would be none of this controversy about the eucalyptus, you know, being removed. Sure. Let, let me make two comments on that. And I'm not going to pass myself off in the expert. There's a really good scientific paper about this from somebody who I know favors native plants. And it discusses that. And it discusses why, while that could be true generally, that again, remember what I said was this, we can do Thanos style and just have that stuff disappear. So to the extent that somebody wants to have a project to have native conifers. I do not believe that, I mean, eucalyptus isn't native to the Biona wetlands. I don't think there were native conifers in the Biona wetlands. So I think, again, you have to think about what the habitat type is. And we also, I think, have to think about, you know, incrementally, what are we trying to do? So do we have to get rid of all of that at once and then hope that conifers come in? Or do we do some pilot projects? So I'm certainly not against pilot projects, you know, in, in the right area to see can we get native trees that will be just as suitable for monarchs? But my understanding based on, again, the literature that I've read um, is that, that that's, not a, a, that's not a tenable option sort of you know, widespread at this point. But again, fair point. Um, there's a couple of comments about the uh, Annenberg proposed center in uh, Bayona. One is that it was really supposed to be a wildlife rehab. That's absolutely false. And I, I have paperwork. Look, in February, so we learned about this in January of 2013, the end of January 2013. It's completely surprised us. They had been working on it for 16 months. So that was a problem right there, right? We found out about it. We instantly tried to start learning about it. I went, I got, this is why I quit my job, right? I went, I got tax returns from the Annenberg Foundation. I saw what they did. The people in Palos Verdes reached out to us and they said, hey, we just dealt with this. We're, we'll help you because they were dishonest. You know, they, they were, look, I like the Annenberg Foundation, but they did not, they were playing, they were not playing fair pool. Let me put it that way. So we went to the LA Times, did a, a editorial soon after. And they said, hey, you know, there's a lot of hubbub about this. We think this is okay. This, this, look, this looks like an okay thing. They didn't even mention 
the domestic animals. Didn't even mention it because they weren't told about it. And we gathered up all kinds of information, finally got a meeting about six months later, and I'm happy to send out the links to the two LA Times editorials. And the second time they said, bad fit for the bioweapons. They, we, we had Shelley Luce from the Santa Monica Bay Restoration Commission send an email in December, right before they announced it to Chuck Bonham, Director of Fish and Wildlife, saying, hey, I'm concerned because this dog and cat thing is gonna be controversial and people aren't mentioning it. Annenberg's not mentioning it in their presentations. And then Chuck Bonham, Director of Fish and Wildlife, when he briefed the Fish and Game Commission in February, he spoke for six minutes and he also didn't mention it. And so I, I, will, I, I will be happy to share whatever material anyone wants. I think I know who maybe that comment came from because the person did not care for the fact who, the particular person who said, this is the best thing that has happened to the Bino wetlands since it was acquired, talking about the, Annen the Annenberg facility. It was 46,000 square feet. It was almost, the, the purpose of it was for domestic dogs and cats. End of story. Everything else was superfluous. So it would be like if I, I couldn't have a bar within 50 feet of a school. So I put a library there that just happened to serve drinks, right? It's, they were, they were I'm just gonna say it, they were dishonest. It made my life miserable for two years. So I'm not, I'm not gonna give any, any you know, credence to that, but uh, happy to discuss more about that. Anything else about the Annenberg Foundation? Got many, many documents. Okay. Um, at least it, it got built somewhere else and- uh, it Called the Annenberg uh, Pet Space. So if it, was, it, if it was supposed to be a wildlife rehab center, that never got built. What got built was the pet space, which was what, what was going to get built in the Vino Wells. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Already. Always welcome to shoot me an email at walter at biona.org. And I it, 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 love questions that are challenging. Again, we need to all, you know, if, if you think I said something that you don't think is quite right, let me know and I'll sh share the documentation. And if I'm wrong, that's great because I'm still learning. I like to learn, but um, you know, when, it, when it's something that's clear cut, we, we come right out and say what the deal is. That's kind of what our organization does. So really appreciate the time tonight. I thank okay, Gabrielle thank for, for joining as well. Yes, uh, that was most interesting. I'm glad she could uh, join us and give, the, give us that perspective. All right, thank you so much, everyone. And we look forward to seeing more of Bayona in the future. And uh, it was certainly wonderful that I got a chance to take uh, Walter's uh, hike this past Saturday. It was really worthwhile. So those hikes, um, do you, you lead them quite regularly, right? Yes, in fact, anyone who wants to email me, walter at biona.org, it can be just you or a group of people. Again, you know, we have to schedule it. I'm, I'm down there a lot, but not every every day. But um, I am happy to, to walk around there with anybody. Um, Cub Scouts, Girl Scouts, church groups, school group, you name it. We do field trips as well. So if you have a class uh, of somebody you know, and, and we, you know, prioritize Title I schools, you know, underprivileged communities, um, especially if we can get you on public transportation, but if not, we'll rent a bus, we'll, we pay for the bus and get kid, the kids down there. And um, so yeah, lots of opportunity to experience the wetlands. Okay, thank you. All right, yes, I'm gonna yes. thank you yet again and um, I'll end the session. Great, thanks very much. Have a good night, everybody. Happy Valentine's uh, night, day, evening. All right, take care, bye-bye. Thank you, bye.